Coupling rods and connecting rods on many kits need to be laminated. The DJH ones don't have to be, they are thick enough to start with. That's um, a time saver, but in the case of the Allen Gibson kit and the Southeastern Finecast kit, the rods have to be laminated. Now it's essential that all the coupling rod and connecting rod pins, crank pin holes, are all aligned. And once again, we're using the cocktail stick, force it through. Now what you mustn't do is get any solder on the outside face, the fluting on the rod. So you need to be very, very careful here. So hold it together. This is called sweating after a fashion, although some people tin the components beforehand. I've never found that necessary. Not too much solder and run it along. Along the top or bottom edge. Check that nothing has moved. Don't take the cocktail stick out yet. That's fine. Now whatever you do, don't remelt the solder that you've just applied. So work away from it. On the opposite end. That way you'll run the risk, or less of a risk, of getting misalignment. Now there has been a little bit of solder crept onto the back. That doesn't matter because it's vital that no solder goes on the front. What you need then to do is to clean up. And we use a small vise and a fine file to do that. Clamp the rod, the laminate in the vise. Gently clean it up. Not too much pressure because if you bend it, you have real trouble. Same the other side. It just removes any excess solder and so on then. Turn around, do the same again. And so on. It neatens up the joint, a little bit more to do there and a little bit to take off the back. But as hoped, we have no solder contamination on the front. If that does happen and you fill the flute, you've got a bit of a job to get rid of it. You have to remelt it and clear it all out. So don't make that mistake to begin with. The Allen Gibson coupling rods are articulated because Allen actually does allow on his chassis for compensation or springing. I personally don't think it's necessary, but then I'm modeling basically in double O gauge, perhaps in the finer gauges, it is necessary. So I hope you can see here, the Allen Gibson rod is in two pieces articulated around the center crank pin, the Southeastern fine cast rods, which can be made articulated if you wish, I've made in one piece and they're now ready to be fitted to the 61XX chassis. However, first thing one needs to do is just put a taper brooch through each of the crank pin holes. Not too much because if you end up with a very very sloppy chassis that's just as bad running as one that's too tight. I just clear them just a few turns just to make sure there's a nice working clearance. A Markets Romford crank pin is one millimeter, so this is a millimeter and a twitch. Very unscientific, but just so you get a working clearance. Remember, you're working to model railway tolerances here. On the real railway, if we use their tolerances, sometimes which are a thousandth of an inch, nothing would work. So just clear those. Just a few turns, not too many, and that will give us a fine working clearance to fix onto the wheels. The next stage is to temporarily fit the coupling rods. Now it's essential that there's no friction on these whatsoever. No tight spots, no binding. Fix temporarily one at a time. Just turn them. Ideally the wheels should revolve quite happily like that. 
if you end up with a tight spot, and if it is, it's going to be at three o'clock or nine o'clock, then you might just have to ease one of these holes with a mouse tail file. Now with modern edge chassis, that should be less necessary, but just occasionally. Now whatever you do, don't start taking great big lumps out of it because you'll end up with a very, very sloppy chassis. Fortunately, perhaps more by good luck than better judgment, this is nice and smooth. Put the other side on. Again, temporarily, I'm not fixing the rods yet. The gearbox, by the way, isn't engaged. It's free to revolve the axle. And do a rolling test on your bench. There should be no interference, no binding, nothing like that. And just test again. No interference whatsoever. Very fortunately, we've reached this stage with a minimum of fuss. A testament to a very well designed and made kit. Next thing we'll do is fit the pickups, permanently attach the rods and see if it works on the track. Whatever locomotive we make, we hope eventually it will run like this. Smoothly, evenly, quietly, no grinding, no jerking. This is a Crown Line A22 and its chassis and motor gearbox are exactly the same as everything I've been describing. Made in exactly the same way. Romford wheels, DJH gearbox and a jig assemble chassis. Let's hope the three that I'm making eventually run as well as this Thompson Pacific. I've now engaged the gearbox onto the driven axle by tightening the grub screw. I'm just going to make sure at this stage before any rods are put on that the gearbox assembly runs properly with no binding. Just attaching a pair of crocodile clips from a 12 volt supply. Turn on the power. That's exactly what we need. Nice even running, no binding backwards, forwards. If you have any binding at this stage that will be transmitted through the rods, you must check at every stage. Remember this has no lubrication yet and it's already nice and sweet, nice and smooth. Next job is to fit the pickups and then the rods. Prior to fitting the pickups, what I'm doing now is tinning the pickup pads. Now, for all the work so far, I've been using 145 degree solder. For electrical work, I'm using this common electrical solder. It has a higher melting point and one assumes makes a better electrical joint. So just apply a small amount. This has flux already in it to the pickup pads. That way I can now install the pickups proper. For the pickups I'm using 0.45 nickel silver wire, 26 standard wire gauge in old money. This is nice and springy. Some people use phosphor bronze. I found this to be superior. It's more springy and yet doesn't impart too much friction on the edge of the wheels. Now just recheck that we're going to put the pickups on the insulated wheels. I've done it the opposite way, I can tell you. And we need to pick up from three wheels one side, which means two pickups from one pad, one from the other. So what I'm going to do is use this pickup front pad to make my joint pickup. Now having said that there's flux already in the solder, I still add a small amount more just to make sure that it flows as I want. Now you can just check the joint, make sure it's nice and firm. Don't tug on it too much, but you should be able to pull a reasonable amount on the solar joint. 
I'm going to start snipping off the excess. Now, if you look here, you can see that the wire, in fact, is going to touch the edge of the gearbox. If that happens, you'll get a short circuit. So what I'm going to do is bend it away so that I end up with a gap. The same with the front one. Just snip off the excess. Now getting the tension right on these is a matter of, of experience and feel. Just bend it so that it touches the wheel. There should be friction and enough just to move the wheel. What I do then is add a second bend so that it doesn't prevent the wheel from turning, but it's giving me a nice positive pickup. When you're happy with that, snip off so that it just protrudes beyond the edge of the wheel. Same with this one. Bend it so that it touches, bend it again, but make sure that it doesn't come into any contact with any of the part of the chassis. The only part that's insulated from the rest of the chassis are the three tires on the market's wheels. When you're happy with that, snip off. Don't snip off too close because that's acting now the way it should, just on the edge of the flange, the back edge of the flange. I now need to add the final pickup and that's done in the same way. Again, just a touch more in the way of flux. Reintroduce the iron. Nice fizz. Nice joint. You can always tell a good solder joint it should be nice and shiny, like I hope those are. Cut off the excess. Again, bend it well clear of the chassis. Make sure it doesn't touch any part of the chassis, otherwise you end up with a dead short. Put another bend in, which gives you that little bit of extra clearance. Check. You should be able to spin the wheels. That's fine. Cut it off again. Now the final job requiring wire is to link the two pickup pads together. So what I'm going to do is stretch a further piece across Again, you must make sure it mustn't touch any part of the gear wheel. I shall bend this once the first part is soldered in. Now, whatever you do, don't dwell with the iron on this second one because your nicely adjusted pickup will merely fall off. So in quickly and out again. Now, if you look closely there, that's very, very close to the edge of the gearbox. So just bend it up slightly out of the way, put a similar bend at the other end, make a loop as it were, so it's clear. It's all a bit fiddly. Once again, a little bit of extra flux and in quickly. Check. Just make sure that there's no interference with any part of the gear wheel. I'm leaving a little bit on the end of that. The reason for that is that that will give me something atta to attach a crocodile clip to should I ever want to just test the chassis. So leave a little bit on the end, like that, obviously not touching the axle, so that you've got something to put a crocodile clip on 
just to test the chassis should anything go wrong later in its life. The next thing I need to do is to wire up the motor. Next, we have to find a path for the electricity to get from the pickups to the motor. So this is ordinary insulated wire stripped at the end and tinned in just the same way that the pickup pads were tinned. But what we mustn't do is interfere with the soldering we've already done on our pickup pad. Trap it with the end of your fingernail. Sum up the courage, add a bit of flux. A touch of solder, more than a little hope. And there you go. That way, I've now got the wire attached and ready to go to the motor. Now, which side you wire it to is very, very important because if it's the opposite way to the way you want, it will run in reverse when you want it to go forward. It's not a matter of life and death. I've checked with this one. It's called polarity and I know which way it should go. However, if you get it the wrong way round, just unsolder the wire and put it to the other motor tag. So we turn it onto the motor tag, already tinned, but even then I add just a little touch of flux. If in doubt, add flux. That way you end up with a really good joint. Just give it a little tug. Now that's given as path from the insulated side of the chassis to the motor. We now have to get from the uninsulated side to the other motor brush. And what I've done here is to tin part of the spacer, which will give me the return path for the electrical current. Again, ordinary wire, place it on the chassis, Again, flux. Dwell a little bit longer because you've got a, a rather larger area to heat up. Just check. If you're not sure, the joint should be nice and bright, just like that. Bend this round. Hold in position. A nice joint. Just check. We have a path from the pickup pad to one side of the motor, and we have a pickup pad, sorry, a pickup path from the chassis to the other side of the motor. Just a little tug, not too much. It's always a good test for a solder joint. If that breaks, it's no good. Next thing is, I'm gonna put it on the test track and see if my wiring works. I'm now testing the motor in the chassis with power from its own pickups. So the rear pickup is working fine and the front pickup is, is working fine. Center one, working fine too. This is just what you hope for. Very little noise, even turning, no grinding, nice and smooth, almost no friction. A little bit of oil on the bearings at this stage and you've got everything sweet, ready to fix on the coupling rods. What I've done is fix the rods on temporarily. And I'm just gonna test it now under its own power, actually driving itself. Before you put the rods on, always do this test. Make sure it's nice and smooth, there's no binding. Remember this is the first time it's moved, so no running in has taken place. That in fact is a very, very good beginning. Next job, secure the rods. 
To secure the rods, we're going to use the Romford system, which is a brass washer, which you solder to the top edge of the crank pin. Um, just to make sure that you don't gum everything up solid with solder, I'm just using paper scrap washers or spacers. This will prevent the solder running through and solidifying everything. And also give me a working clearance. The Romford crank pin sets come with these little washers. Whatever you do, order some more because you're bound to lose some. They ping across the room into oblivion. You'll find them, by the way, when you're searching for something else. Now these are soldered in place. And once again, use the end of your finger just to make sure that it's a nice snug fit. Not too tight, otherwise you run the risk of soldering everything up. A little bit of flux. It will flash into place. Just check. If you can't do this, you've done what I've just said and soldered everything solid. Then you have to take it all apart and as before, your vocabulary will expand even further. There's no need to do the centre one at this stage because that will have the big end of the connecting rod when the cylinders, etc., are put on. So it's fore and aft. Flash in, nice fizz. Just check. Then you do the same with the other side. Next job is to remove the surplus length of the crank pins. Now some people use cutters for this. I find that just a little bit extreme. So I prefer to use a piercing saw and files. Just get the saw in position, carefully file adjacent to the crank pin. And off it comes. You're left with a slightly rough finish. Clean it up first of all with a fairly coarse file. Just to make sure everything's nice and flush. And remember with this being the front driven axle you'll need this crank pin washer to be fairly thin to make sure it clears the crosshead. If nothing else, it will test whether or not your soldering has flown, flown right in. And I think it has flowed in. Nice and neat. When you're happy with that, just tear off the paper washer. That way you have a nice, even, neat working clearance. I'm going to do the other three and then take it on to the test track. The rods are now secure, securely soldered on, paper washers thrown away, and now the chassis is under its own power. Now, considering this is brand new, it hasn't been run in at all, that's not bad at all. You'll find that when the locomotive body is fitted, the extra weight will in make sure that Pickup is superior, pickup is better, but that's already quiet and smooth and nice and e even. No tight spots, no binding, no grinding. It's all down to luck. We have to fit the wheels to the Gibson chassis. These are Alan Gibson's own wheels. Now he produces his own crank pins, which are fine. My personal preference is for the Romford but the wheels are fully flexible enough to take both systems. Now, quartering a Gib the Allen Gibson wheel isn't quite as easy as the Romford wheel, but it isn't that difficult. This is a Midland built 4F and Midland locomotives had right hand leads, so the same principles. I've fitted one wheel to its axle. Now the trick is to look through the spokes for the quartering to get 90 degrees. So, Position that more or less in the right place on the one side. Start 
the wheel going onto its axle. Check again. Peering through the spokes so they line up. And then force the wheel on. If you now see the spokes are in line, that wheel is then quartered. What you have to check is that you've got the correct back to back. This is milled steel. It doesn't have to be this big. I have a friend who's an engineer and he made this for me, but they're available from all decent model suppliers. Now at the moment that's loose, so we need to force the wheel a bit further on. You'll find it'll probably go a bit too far, never mind. Just ease it back out. That's a nice snug fit now. You've probably disturbed the quartering. That's the way it should be, with all the spokes in line. When you're happy that the quartering is correct, and it does take time, you'll find as well, you'll probably have to just use a small brooch, a taper brooch, to take out a little bit of the inside of the bearing, just to make sure that everything is clear. Now, don't take too much, do it a tiny bit at a time and also check that you haven't disturbed the quartering. And then just run a little bench test. There shouldn't be any binding. And there isn't. You can then proceed to actually fix these on once you've tightened the grub screw and made sure that everything is sweet and smooth. The next stage is to fit the brakes. Now on the A2, the brakes were fitted before the wheels. It's just a different design. This is the fret, the brakes for the Allen Gibson 4F. I prefer to leave all the bits and pieces on the fret so that any drilling can take place with them well supported. Now, drilling the holes in the components, they are, they are half etched, but you need to clear them. I use a pin chuck with a small bit and for those of you who have very soft palms, use a drawing pin in the end to act as a bearing and then just drill carefully through. You make lots of little woodworm holes in your bench at the same time. Do the lot all in one go. Now for fitting the individual brake shoes, brake blocks, I'm using a pair of self-locking tweezers, absolutely invaluable. Clamp the one end. I'm supporting the chassis in a Pico foam cradle. Very handy, stops it moving around. Carefully position your brake shoe. Apply a small amount of flux. Pick up. small amount of solder and introduce it. Make sure it's solidified. Check that the shoe isn't touching the wheel. They're not real brakes these. If they did we would have short circuits and binding. One thing you have to remember by the way is Alan Gibson wheels are made of steel. The tyres are made of steel and they will rust very quickly in the presence of phosphoric acid. You then repeat so that all the six shoes are in position. This is the Great Western 262 chassis with all the brake gear erected in the same sequence that I've just described. This time all the pull rods and cross hangers are in place. Again, make sure that there's no interference, nothing is touching anywhere otherwise you really have trouble. That's a common cause of complaints as you get shorting and binding. You have to really, I suppose, take them further away from, from dead scale. Now you'll notice too, I hope, that 
the Allen Gibson 4F chassis has pickups both sides because that's because Allen's wheels are plastic centered. So you have to find a method of getting electricity from both sides. So it's the same arrangement. Some people like plunger pickups. I have to be honest, I don't. Allen's um, kits can be built with plunger pickups. Anybody's can, but to really adjust them, you have to take the wheels off and that's a disadvantage. One thing I hope you'll also notice is that I've fitted small bore plastic PVC tubing. Now, I have a good friend who's in the telecom industry and he gets this stuff. He buys it, he doesn't, doesn't pinch it, I hasten to add. Um, but I'm told you can get it from um, electrical, small electronic electrical shops. Just cut it to length and it goes over the pickup. What it means is there's no chance then of any of these live wires touching the chassis because that's when you get a short. And that's about it for this stage. After all the brakes are on, I fit the balance weights. Now on two cylinder engines, they're usually opposite the cranks. On three cylinder engines, they could be in all sorts of relative positions or four cylinder engines. Now these come as etchings. The modern uh, Romford Markets wheel has no balance weights etched in, it's far superior. They're very, very easy to fix. Rest them in position, just checking so that they're opposite the crank. Small amount of super glue on the end of a piece of wire. And you'll find capillary action will draw the super glue in behind the balance weight. Obviously don't disturb it yet. The next job or the final job on the prelim preliminary side of the chassis, if I could say that, is any bogies or ponies. This is a 262 so it has a pair of ponies. The A2 obviously being a Pacific has a bogey and a pony. Now this is an etching made up very easily. Obviously take care when putting it together that everything's square. Now I mentioned earlier shouldered screws for holding it in. This is something that Southeastern Finecast give you. It's a small white metal collar which fits over an 8BA screw. What it means is that will give you something that it will turn on and you can tighten it up and it won't fall off. Now we should find that the balance weight is secured by now so we can turn the chassis thus, put that into position and then carefully screw it up tight. If that's very tight, then you have a problem, but that gives a nice working clearance. Plenty of movement, and because we're able to tighten it up, then it's not going to fall off. That's a, a screw with a collar or a shouldered screw. It, it, it comes in all sorts of different varieties. Now at this point, this locomotive obviously has outside cylinders. The A2 has outside cylinders and outside valve gear. The 4F is easier because that's inside cylinders. But I never take a chassis any further at this stage until I build a body. If you put loads of fine detail on, then you're going to have trouble actually handling it because the basic chassis is used as a jig to erect the body, to check everything square. So I get to this stage and then I turn my attention to making the body.